Brilliant. Okay, you better clap or else I'm going to lose my job here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm talking about the micro bit today. Now, I don't know how much about the micro bit you guys know, but uh, it's kind of a cool story. Uh, and it all kind of starts off with this thing. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, who knows what this is? Shout it out. That's right, it's a BBC Micro, very good. First commissioned in 1981 by the BBC, uh, who in an effort to make the British public more computer savvy, uh, launched the, the Computer Literacy Project, which was to take the form of a series of instructional books, TV shows, and an accompanying microcomputer. Uh, the contract to manufacture which was won by a little IT company called Acorn, uh, whose Acorn Proton became uh, the, the, the BBC Micro. It was rebranded and launched as part of the programme. Uh, now, you know, it's true what they say about tiny acorns and mighty acorns. So uh, acorns and centralised involvement in the project made them exceedingly rich, growing their profits from £3,000 in 1979 to £8.6 million in 1983. So really, really good for them. Of that, they invested £5 million in research. And in 1983, working on a BBC micro, they finalised their simulated design for a new low-power risk architecture called the Acorn Risk Machine. There we go, this one. Uh, a hardware prototype followed soon afterwards, in the October of that year, and that was called the ARM-1. Acorn set up a new subsidiary to manage this and all subsequent versions of their new architecture, which turned out to be so successful that even after Acorn bit the dust in 2000, would continue on as ARM Holdings, and would go on to license their products to basically every smartphone, car, toaster, refrigerator, and Japanese talking toilet in the entire universe. So really good for them. 30 years later, the BBC puts the word out they want to do another crazy moonshot computer literacy project, and a, a crack team of industry partners answers the call, one of whom is ARM, whose embed platform becomes the basis for the new project's hardware. The new device is called the Microbit, and has at its heart a Nordic Semiconductor NRF5188 uh, system on chip, um, which is based on the very same ARM architecture whose first version was designed all those years ago on a BBC Micro. So it's kind of a nice sense of things kind of coming full circle here, which I'm hoping this slide will make clear to you. Uh, so the BBC commissioned Acorn to build the micro, uh, to rebrand the micro, uh, on which it designed uh, the first ARM architecture, which is the basis for ARM Holdings, who donate their embed hardware to the micro bit for the BBC. So things have kind of come round. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, but that's all ancient history. We are not historians, we are hackers. So we were more interested in asking the questions of how secure is this micro bit? And can we make it break in any kind of interesting ways? So the first thing that we looked at was the compiler chain. Now the BBC Micro has a really nice online browser-based compiler that you can access for free from your own computers. And it allows you to uh, create code in a variety of different formats, some of which are uh, Code Kingdom's JavaScript, which if you've ever used Scratch before is basically Scratch. Uh, Microsoft Block Editor, which if you ever use Scratch before, is basically Scratch. Um, Microsoft Touch Develop, which I would encourage you to use once and probably never use again, because it's, um, uh, well, there's also MicroPython, that's the other one you can code in. Uh, and MicroPython's pretty good, that's a lean implementation of, of Python 3 that's been developed to run on microcontrollers. So the way that works is the user gives their, their MicroPython code, and out comes a very nice but quite opaque blob of hex, which you then flash onto your micro bit. So we asked the question, well, what's in that, that hex blob? Can we pull out anything interesting? And it turns out we could. So in that hex blob, we were able to recover things like hard-coded constants, string literals, and key data structures for the, for the user's program, as well as getting, idea, idea, getting an idea of what the program was trying to do. Um, but we were quite surprised to find that we could also pull out things like user-defined variable, user variable class and function names, which is kind of a surprise. You, you can't always get that when you're, when you're trying to do this kind of task. Uh, and even more surprisingly was the fact that we could also pull out user-defined comments, which probably shouldn't be in there. So if you're like an 11-year-old programming this at home, you might not sort of have in your head that your comments are going to be visible to anyone who uses it. So kind of interesting that we, that we found that. Okay, we said, but that's, that's a little bit too easy. Most of the time, if, we are, um, if, we, if an attacker has one of these in front of them, they're not going to likely have access to that original hex file. More likely, as will be the case, they'll have access to the, the microbit itself, the device. So we asked the question, okay, can we do the same kind of thing to a microbit that's already been flashed? Uh, now, here's a microbit. There's loads of cool hardware on here, including a compass, a battery clip, a Bluetooth antenna out there. Fancy GPIO capacitive touch sensing pins and accelerometer, and like a bunch of other stuff, right? Just stuff. Uh, and there's even more stuff on the back. There's LEDs, buttons, you name it, the whole works. We don't care about any of that. We're just interested in this guy, 
That's the Nordic chip. That kind of does the main heavy lifting on the micro bits, kind of the processor as far as we're concerned. And this guy over here, which is the NXP chip. And what that seems to do is manage things like battery management um, and also serial communication over that USB clip you can see at the top there. And what we found that is if we plugged in a USB port over here, uh, plugged in a USB cable over here, we could set up a connection over that via this NXP chip, connect to a GDB session, and via that, dump the entirety of the hex from our microbit. Cool. Once we've got that, we can proceed as before and pull out all that wonderful information we just found the first time. Really nice, nice result. All right, we said, okay, we're kind of on the chip at this point. So we were asking the question of, well, what else is interesting there? What else can we kind of poke at and pull out? Um, now, here's a block diagram for the Nordic chip. It's, I know it's a bit yucky. Um, don't worry, I'll tell you what everything is. Uh, we're connected up here. That's the serial wire debug peripheral. So that's kind of where we're talking to the chip from. And over here, this thing is a memory bus. So via that, we can, we can access all the different bits of memory and peripherals that are on the chip, including this thing over here. That's the code memory. So that's what we've just done. We, via our serial wire debug peripheral, we sent a request to that code memory, and it's very kindly given us all of its code. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Nice result. OK. So there's also this thing over here. That guy is the FICR. That's the Factory Information Configuration Register. And that looked kind of interesting. It looked like it might have some kind of interesting information for us to pull out there. So we did the same thing again. From our serial wire debug port, we uh, sent a request over and tried to get that data. So what do you think happened? Well, you'd hope so, but actually, it didn't, right? It tried to stop us. This guy over here, that's the non-volatile memory controller. That piped up and said, no, you can't, you can't have that memory. You, should, you, know, you shouldn't have access to it right now. You're debugging. You don't need to read that. And that's kind of good security. We shouldn't have access to that right now. But what we found that was quite interesting was that this thing over here, this is the CPU. So that's kind of, oh, there we go, this guy is the CPU. Um, and if we instead sent our request to the CPU and had it kind of ask on our, our behalf, what we'd find then is that the FICR would dump the entire contents of all of its memory, and we could quite happily read that over the, the, uh, the serial port. Nice. Uh, and what was in there? Well, a bunch of cool stuff, uh, including the CPU ID, a 32-bit unique uh, device identifier, and also the chip's 128-bit hardwired Bluetooth encryption route, which you could use, it was involved in uh, uh, Bluetooth communication from the chip. Very nice, there it is. And I've got a little demo for you. You probably won't be able to see this at the back, but um, here we have a micro bit, quite happily printing out its encryption route for us. So that's a, a cool thing. Um, I hope you can see that. That's what it's doing there. Okay, so at this point we were kind of we were, we were kind of breaking into our stride, and we we're asking what else is there on the chip that we can have a poke at. Now this guy down here, this is a peripheral involved in uh, AES mode, AES ECB mode encryption, um, and the way that works is a user writes their their key to a particular location in memory, along with the data they'd like to be encrypted. Uh, and the, the peripheral has a look at that, does a little bit of thinking, and then produces the encrypted data, writes it back to a location that the user can read it out from. But it turns out these two locations uh, are still read-enabled. So we can come in and read out their key along with their plain text, just like that. So we've kind of got around this, which is pretty cool. Um, nice one. Okay, so at this point, we can kind of read whatever we like on the chip, right? We can, we can see the different peripherals that are there, um, read out data from them, we're kind of, we're kind of done. Um, we've, we've got the data we want, closed book, go home, fantastic, box, pwned, whatever. But, um, I mean, so what? Like, we've, 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 po we've popped a box, big deal, people do that every day, right? I mean, surely you as users are never going to worry that this particular micro bit is ever going to be involved in your personal security or well-being or safety, surely, yeah? But I'd like to remind you about this slide back here, right? So none of the techniques I've described to you today are specific to a micro bit necessarily. And I, I reckon that um, if we can do this to a micro bit, the chances are that a lot of those techniques will work on these devices too. So if I can hack your micro bit, I can probably hack your toilet too. But arguably more important is, is this point. You've got to remember what the micro bit is set out to accomplish. It's being put out there to hopefully inspire a new generation of scientists, engineers, and hackers. Um, and it's doing quite well at that. It's got a really nice, engaging user interface, really cool compiler, lots of kind of fun things to play with. It's got a nice low barrier to entry that gets harder as the user gets more proficient at using it, which is great. 
Um, but you've also got to, to bear in mind that the position the microbit occupies in sort of our, our sphere uh, comes with a, quite a lot of responsibility. Uh, and for many people who use it, it will be their first introduction to coding and, and tech in general. As such, I think it kind of, it almost sets the standard for what a, a good, sound, secure system should look like. Um, but what we've shown here is that even right now, as this, this device is being handed out to year sevens across the country, there are a couple of arguably quite fundamental security problems with it. So my question to you guys today is, well, is that acceptable? OK, so that's the end of my talk. I really hope you enjoyed it. Great. <laughs> so I'm definitely keeping my job then, hopefully. <laughs> cool. A um, couple of quick things for you. Um, if you'd like to get your own microbit, you can do so there. That's the guys who are in charge of supplying them. Um, have a look at that. I think they're about £10 or so. Um, that's my GitHub over there that you can have a look at. I've got on there some code that you can use for dismantling your personal um, hex files that you generate. And over the next few days, I'll also be putting out a little patch that you can use to stop people doing that to you, if you'd like. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in microbits and want to continue the conversation, that's my Twitter at the bottom. Cool. So lastly, I just want to thank um, some of the guys who helped me with this talk, uh, all the guys at Raytheon who've been amazing, uh, so Paul, Simon, Tom, Jamie, uh, Dave, and everyone else who doesn't want to be named. Um, the microbit list have been amazing, uh, as of OpenOCD, and finally, my amazing mentors. Thank you, guys. Tom and FC. Thanks, guys. Cheers.